Okay, so uh, picking up where we left off, um, we are going to explore some of the properties of that Gaussian beam solution, which let me write what it is and, and we'll spend a lot of time kind of analyzing various limit cases of the solution. So the positive frequency component of the electric field has some spatial uh, profile. And remember the actual electric field, you basically take the real part of this and that becomes the, well, you, you take this spatial component, you multiply by e to the minus i omega t and you take the real component and that becomes the actual traveling wave. And this, we broke up into some slow moving envelope, psi of r times what would have been the plane wave, e to the i k z. And k, I've, I've been a little bit sloppy here. k is two pi over lambda, where lambda is the actual, um, actual wavelength in the actual media. And uh, this also equals c times omega, where c is, c is index of refraction times c naught omega. So, so what this means is that for a fixed omega, and, and omega is really what is fixed. If you, if you have light that's going in and out of me media, the frequency of the jiggling always stays fixed. It's the wavelength that gets changed. And in fact, the wavelength gets compressed. So for a constant omega, um, if I solve for lambda, it looks like the, the lambda gets compressed by a factor of n. So I think I was a little bit sloppy about this kind of going back and forth between where I put the ends. If I always put the ends inside of this C, then it's easy to easy to follow, easier to follow along. Um, so this defines K. It's a, a radians per wavelength. So when Z goes up by one wavelength, this goes two pi radians. And uh, and this is the wavelength in the media, not the wavelength of vacuum. And the actual solution, let me write it here, contains three, three terms. The first term is some overall constant times this width, beam width parameter. Uh, let me be a little bit more explicit about my omegas versus my w's. Let me make my w's a little bit more spiky. So w naught over w as a function of z. And I'll, I'll write what these things are in a, in a little bit, times the exponent of minus r squared. This is the cylindrical r, not the spherical r, over w of z squared. So this sets the, the amplitude, and the rest of the terms are all pure phase. So, so what is w naught? Well, w naught is our single parameter that defines the, the fatness of the beam at the origin. So how, how wide the beam is at the origin. And once you specify that one parameter uh, along with the wavelength, which this whole thing is for a fixed, uh, a fixed omega and therefore a fixed wavelength, uh, once you specify those two things, the, the, whole, the whole pattern is, is fixed. Uh, okay, and so let me write what, what W of Z is. W of, of Z is uh, W naught at the origin times the square root of one plus Z over Z naught squared. So as you go, uh, when Z is zero, this is just W naught. And as Z gets bigger or Z gets big negative, this grows in the pattern that we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, Z naught is just a convenient constant. This is just defined to be one over a uh, half K, um, K W naught squared. And uh, let me write the next term here. So it's this times a phase factor I K Z. So this is the I K Z from here minus I arc tangent arc tangent of Z over Z naught. So Z naught clearly sort of sets the scale for everything that happens in the Z direction times another phase factor 
which has to do with the radial component, I k r squared over two capital R of z. And let me write what capital R of z is. This is z times one plus z naught over z. So it's opposite of opposite of the others. That's typically z over z naught. Okay, so um, r, right, and this is not r squared because to get the units right, this k, k has units of one over wavelength. So there's two distances on top and two, two distances on the bottom. Okay, so um, these bottom two terms are just phase factors. So if we want the intensity of the beam, it's just this amplitude squared. And if we were to plot what the intensity looks like as a function of r, the cylindrical coordinate away from the center, this is just going to be a Gaussian that falls off when, when r is this beam width, which is now a function of z, when r is a beam width, intensity it's this thing squared. So it's uh, this exponential factor um, is one over E squared times the ratio of W naught over WZ squared times E plus magnitude squared. Over this uh, this eta two eta to get the intensity. So as as you go farther and farther out in R, this falls off exponentially, and and the profile is is Gaussian as a as a function of R. Right, this this prefactor term doesn't depend on R; it only depends on z. So so the the amplitude falls off as you get farther away. Uh, the amplitude at the center falls off as you get farther away, and also the, uh, the the profile at any particular z looks Gaussian. So, if uh, let me see, I think one of the things that I did not calculate was the power. So let me call. Let me. I'm gonna have to erase something somewhere. So let me erase stuff at the top. Uh, fortunately, this is super big. I'll erase stuff at the top and right up here. So one of the things you can show is that the, the intensity is, is falling off as you get farther away because the beam is spreading out. But if you look at the power, which is the integral well, but let me define one thing here first. Let me define the intensity at, at the origin at z equals zero. This is just the intensity at z equals zero. So I'll just plug, plug in z equals zero here. Um, omega, sorry, w of z at z equals zero is just w naught. So, so these terms cancel out. So this is just uh, e. Yeah, this is E naught plus magnitude squared over two eta to get it to the right units. I, saw, uh, I think I'm wrong about this. This two goes in the numerator to, to turn a amplitude into an intensity uh, times uh, times E to the You know, uh, times e to the minus zero. So, so that's that's fine. This is just the intensity at the origin looks like this. All right, let's calculate the power, the power at at any particular z. So, imagine we put a screen. Let me just draw the draw the beam over here. 
if we put a screen at some particular z and integrate it over the whole area and asked how much power is, is hitting the whole screen, not just how much power is power per area is hitting at a particular point. And what we would do is we would take the intensity as a function of z and r and integrate this intensity 2 pi r dr. And uh, if you do this, if you do this integral, this Gaussian integral just gives you a, uh, a, a constant out. And so what you see is that uh, what you'll get is that you'll just, just get the I naught, the intensity at the origin over two times pi w naught squared. So, so this is uh, the area of a circle of, uh, of radius w naught, which is that, that radius. And uh, the, the, uh, the total power is independent of z. And it's the same as the power, uh, it's, it's the intensity at the origin times the area of the beam divided by two because, because it's, it's falling off. Uh, it's not it's not uniform it's not a uniform circle of this area it's a the falling off Gaussian with this sort of characteristic scale uh, but but this power is independent of Z so that's nice no matter where you put this screen all the all the laser power is gonna gonna get there it's just gonna spread out okay so so let's talk about some some limits and actually dive into this geometry a little bit more so let me see where I am going to erase what I just wrote up here because I want to keep all the definitions of everything. But I'll, I'll redraw this picture. So when people talk about Gaussian beams, they often draw, draw the following picture and and label in the following way, but keep in mind that this picture here. So here's the here's the z-axis, and I'm going to draw a beam that comes comes in, comes back out. And on the other side, it comes in, comes back out. Uh, I need to get a new pen. comes in, comes back out. So if at any point I take a cross section of this beam, the pattern I would get on a, on a screen, so say the beam is going this way, the pattern I would get on a screen is just a Gaussian. And that means that there's no hard cutoff. So when I draw this hard cutoff, I'm really drawing the, uh, the kind of one over E point of of this exponential, so so this is the the distance where um, where the radius is falling off. So right at the origin here, this distance is w naught, and then as you go further and further away, this distance is w of z. So it's a one-sided distance. Um, what is this z naught? Well, I, if I were to plot it on the graph. Um, what, well, what is the maybe what is the interpretation of the z naught? It is. It is roughly where w transitions from from being pretty close to w naught in the center. Right when z is really tiny, it's one plus something tiny. We can ignore it. To when uh, when z is really big. It's it's this term that dominates and the width grows linearly with z. And z naught is kind of the transition where that where that takes place. So you can kind of label there's a plus a plus z naught and a minus z naught. And 
for for very large z here so w of z as z goes goes to infinity as z gets big we can ignore this one term and so this is w naught times the square root of this thing squared so this is just w naught over z naught times the absolute value of z so w just grows linearly with z for large large z with some characteristic slope if i were to plot that let me change colors here So, were to plot that growth, it would. So, this is an imaginary growth that only really takes into effect uh, as z goes out to infinity. If I were to plot that, it would eventually asymptote to that line. And same thing going this way, same thing going this way, same thing going this way. Okay, so. Um, this whole this whole beam is pretty uh, pretty paraxial. So this this angle that that it's making here, let's call this theta theta naught. The angle that this beam is making is kind of small, and so that means that the angles are pretty close to the slopes. So the actual theta naught here is uh, the arc tangent arc. Arc tan of w naught over z naught, which is pretty close to just w naught over z naught. And if I plug in the numbers here, um, what I get is I get that this is w naught over this. So there's a factor of w naught on the bottom. Uh, it'd be a 2 over k w naught for this angle. And if I were to plug in the definition of k, remember k, k is 2 pi over lambda. If I were to plug in the definition of k here, I would get that this equals um, lambda over pi w naught. OK, so this is, uh, I forget who asked me on the first day, this is now sort of mathematical proof that the smaller you make the beam waste, the larger the angle of spread is. And you know the exact whether, whether you call this the, the half angle or the full angle, right? If I were to call this the full angle here, then uh, the factor would be two over pi, which which is not that different from one. But the angle is pretty close to wavelength over beam waste. So uh, this is this is true in optics a lot. Uh, in any sort of diffraction system, the any wave system, the, the tighter you try to confine the waves, the more they want to spread out. So uh, yes, it's it's like cats if you try to corral them into the carrier to bring them to the vet. They scatter as far and wide as they can possibly get. So that's true of waves in general. The tighter you make this focus, the more quickly it will spread out. And it's always some order one factor times the wavelength over the tightness. And that order one factor depends on exactly how you define this tightness. So here we define the tightness as, as being the one over E amplitude. But if we had defined the tightness slightly differently, we could have made this prefactor literally just one. So uh, yeah, it's so wavelength over uh, over the, the tightness always defines some sort of angle, angular spread. All right, so uh, let me, let's actually do a numerical example before I talk about some of these phase terms here. So in maybe in the next class or two classes from now, We'll talk about how to manipulate these beams. So this is this is used in a couple of different ways. One, it, this is what it looks like inside of a laser cavity, and it's also what it looks like coming out of the laser cavity. So if you just have a mirror here, 
the, a laser cavity is made of two mirrors, one of which is slightly leaky. And the, the leaky part of the beam, which is the part that makes it out, is just continuous with this wave. So um, the, the part of the laser that makes it out is has exactly this form. It's just the origin is probably somewhere inside of the laser rather than uh, or rather than at the, at the at the exit. But uh, we'll see in a second how to manipulate. Well, we'll see in a couple of classes how to manipulate these. So if you put put this through lenses or uh, reflect it off of spherical mirrors, there's a pretty simple formulism for for how you go from Gaussian beams uh, on one side of the lens to what ends up being a Gaussian beam on the other side of the lens. And uh, the lens will just turn a beam with a particular width and a particular location along the z-axis into a beam with probably a different width and probably a different uh, zero on the z-axis. And so uh, no matter how complicated your lens and mirror system is, if, if, they're, uh, if they're thin lenses, you know, where, where, uh, where the radius of curvature is, uh, or well, where the lens is thin compared to, you know, how far away you put it from the origin here. So if you have a pretty skinny lens over here, for example, it will just turn this beam into another Gaussian beam with a, a origin somewhere else and a new width. So this is pretty useful for things like uh, telescopes and optical communications. So let's do an example here. I'm just going to erase the I'm going to erase the left side of this diagram. Let's do an example here, which is a Gaussian beam coming out of a quantum communication satellite that that was launched a few years ago by the Chinese. So this is called the Mesius satellite. You see a satellite. And the, the telescope diameter on the satellite, so the diameter of a telescope, is about 30 centimeters. And these the, the lens system in the telescope is designed to fill. So if this is the, the telescope and the diameter is 30 centimeters, usually you make W naught sort of fill about you go goes about halfway out. So you you don't want it to you don't want W naught to go all the way out because then you're losing some light. Remember this is just just the the one over E amplitude. So um, the 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 beam that hits the mirror of this telescope is manipulated so that its W naught is about a quarter of the of the diameter of the telescope. And so you can think about this whole beam coming out as having a W naught that's a certain size, and the wavelength that the that the telescope uses is 800, 850, 50 nanometers. And let's say that it is uh, well, it's an orbit, and satellite orbits are about 500 kilometers off the ground. Uh, this is a little bit higher than the International Space Station. The International Space Station is about 350 kilometers high. But the question is, when this beam leaves the telescope and it has a W naught of uh, a quarter of 30 centimeters, what is the size of the beam? What is W of Z? Uh, you know, under this approximation, when it hits when it hits the ground. So this sort of determines how how much light you can capture on the ground. And I'm going to take a, take a quick break here and let you plug in some numbers from the diameter of the telescope and, and wavelengths. And, uh, and you can draw, draw some diagram of this thing spreading out and going to the ground. So let me take a pause there. Uh, in fact, I will actually take a pause go grab some water because my throat is very dry. So I'll let you I'll let you calculate how big this beam is on the ground. Either it's sort of 
one over e radius or a diameter or something, something to that effect. All right, I'll do that. Okay, would anyone like to volunteer a rough estimate for uh, either the kind of radius of the beam or the diameter of the beam or any, you know, you could tell us exactly what you calculated, but. Will be an extremely long, awkward pause. Um, I guess I got like one point eight meters for the radius of the beam. I think. And uh, that sounds about right. Uh, what What did you What did you do? Um, so I multiplied five hundred kilometers by lambda over pi um, w naught. Um, and plugged in all the values you gave us. Yeah, so this, something like this, this was 30, 30 over four centimeters. Um, so this W naught of, oh, sorry. That was, yeah, you, this, this was 500 kilometers was the magnitude of Z and this W naught over Z is lambda, so 850 nanometers over pi times the 30 over four centimeters, something like that. And that gives you roughly what, what the W of, of Z is at the surface, yeah. And and you got 1.8 meters, yeah, oh, yeah, I think that's right. So, so that, that means that the diameter of the beam is about 3.6 meters when it hits the ground. And uh, to capture the entangled photons from this satellite, they use a, a telescope on the ground that has a diameter of about one meter. And so their, their efficiency is the, the area of 
you know, it's roughly the area of the telescope, telescope on ground divided by the area of the beam on ground. So this is pi one meter squared over pi. Um, oh, sorry, this is uh, one, one meter over two squared times pi. And then you said uh, one, 1.8 meters squared. Yeah, so this efficiency works out to be about 8%. So, you know, it's not exactly 8% because it's actually a Gaussian beam, but um, this this W width is a pretty good, pretty good estimate for where most of the beam is located. So nine, I don't know, 95% of the beam or something is, is located in there. So, you know, just purely from this uh, optics of beams, you can work out roughly how big, you know, if you were to work backwards, you want to say, okay, I want to get about 10% of my photons. How big do I need the, the telescope to be on the satellite? Uh, it, it turns out that for, for visible, visible light, and this is barely visible, but it's pretty close to red light, uh, you get pretty, pretty reasonable numbers, 30 centimeter diameter telescope. So, uh, yeah, all right, thank you. Um, any other kind of questions about, about that calculation or uh, how, how one might apply these kind of angle estimates? Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about is is then the, the phase. And let me give myself a little bit more room here. So I am going to, I think I'm gonna erase all of this and I'm just gonna write the total phase factor. So I'm ignoring the amplitude now. I'm just gonna write e to the this minus that plus that. That's gonna be my total phase factor. And we'll, we'll talk about what each of those terms mean. And uh, I'll show why, kind of how this maps on to uh, the, how this is like a, a piece of a spherical wave, like the ones that you will calculate in, in Python and, and why, um, even though I used, well, I asked you to calculate the interference between two spherical waves to get the, the circular pattern of fringes that if you watch the video, you, you saw me do. Um, but, you know, we don't have actual spherical waves. The laser is not a source that's really spreading light out uniformly in every direction. The laser is spreading light out uh, mostly in the forward direction in this Gaussian pattern. So why was it a good approximation to uh, to pretend that it's a, a spherical wave. That's what I'll I'll uh, talk about now. So the total phase vector. Uh, too many T's. Total phase vector looks something like x of I K Z minus I arctan of Z over Z naught plus I K R squared over this capital R uh, two capital R of Z. Okay. So let's talk about what each of these terms are. This first term is just the plane wave like phase factor that's going pretty fast. Um, and it's, it's planes of phase going in the z direction. On top of that, I'm adding this, this small correction. Remember arc tangent starts off at minus pi over two and then crosses zero and goes to plus 
pi over two. So uh, when when z is much bigger than the z naught, when when you've transitioned to the the spreading part of the beam, this is just a constant. It's basically pi over two. And when it's when it's very negative, it, it's also just a constant, negative pi over two. And kind of somewhere between the the two transition points, this phase factor just slowly changes from minus a little bit to plus a little bit. Whereas this factor is changing, it's going two pi every wavelength. So, so this is a very small effect, but it's it's important to, for certain um, resonant cavities that, that we'll deal with. But, but for now, we can just think about it as a very small effect. This last effect, uh, this is, oh, this has a name. I don't speak French, but Gué, uh, I don't know. I don't know if someone wants to correct my French pronunciation of this person's name, I'd be happy to hear it. Um, this last term is called the radial phase. Because um, for a fixed Z, this uh, is rings of phase that, uh, that change as you go further away from the origin. Remember, this r is the cylindrical r. So little little r here is uh, x squared plus y squared. All right. So let's let's compare this. Compare to spherical wave. Oh, I'm running out of that color. Okay. Compared to spherical wave, what does a spherical wave look like? Well. It, Spherical wave has an E plus of R. So it looks like this, E, it's an E naught over capital R. Now capital R here uh, is a, a spherical coordinate. X of I, K, capital R. And if I look at the phase here, so this, this just means that as you go away from the, as you go away from the center, you have, spherical waves that every time you go one more wavelength away from, from the center, you change by two pi worth of phase. K is, K is always two pi over lambda. All right, so, so let's, let's do some approximations here and show that when, when Z is large, this phase factor here looks a lot like the combination of those two phase factors. So, uh, so let's let's do that. So, so for for z much much bigger than the cylindrical coordinate r, capital R, which is x squared plus y squared plus c squared. If z is really big, then I can factor out absolute value of z here. And I get that this is the square root of 1 plus this, x squared plus y squared over z squared. So this is r squared, r squared over z squared. OK. And for really big z, so I haven't, I haven't actually done anything yet, but for really big z, this is approximately 1 plus a half r squared over z squared. Okay, and now I can kind of multiply through. So this is magnitude of z times uh, pl uh, plus r squared over two magnitude of z because z squared is always positive. Um, and I can say that this is uh, approximately, Well, well, let me let me pause there for a second. Uh, well, uh, let me let me go one more approximation. So, so when when z is much much bigger than r, and I can replace this z by by r, right? So, so imagine I'm I'm kind of way out here, where my z is much bigger than any 
any distance away from the z-axis, then the z distance is not that different from the actual real uh, spherical radial distance. So let me approximate this again by z plus r squared over two capital R. All right, and, and that is exactly the combination that we have here. We have z, at, le at least for positive z, this is i k z and i k r squared over two r of z. So that, this allows us to interp interpret this. Oh, so yeah, so i k times this stuff is very much like i k times that plus i k times that. So except for this constant offset here, this allows us to interpret r, r of z as, as the radius of curvature of the phase, phase fronts. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'll, I'll try to pull up the animation in a second. But remember, in the toward the origin, the phases were kind of vertical. But as you as we got further and further away, they started to turn more and more into what looked like uh, kind of curved uh, curved things with some radius. And the as long as you're sort of not too far from the origin, these really do look like circles of a particular radius. And the, by doing this approximation of a truly spherical wave, we see that as long as you're kind of far, far away from the origin and you're not too far off axis, um, the phase fronts of the spherical wave look a lot like the phase fronts of this uh, this uh, Gaussian beam. All right. Now, um, let me write what this R of Z is, and then I'll say a few words about what happens when we put this thing in, in between years, and then uh, and then I'll end. So. Okay, so this is just this is recalling the definition of R of Z. This was Z times, let me pull that up. Okay, Z times one plus Z naught over Z squared. And as long as Z is much, much bigger than Z naught, as long as you've, you're far enough into the transition where it looks more like an angle rather than a sort of flat flat section, then we can ignore the second term and this just looks like Z. So this is very similar to this last approximation that we made where as long as we're uh, far in the Z axis, but not too far off the origin, uh, this uh, radius of uh, this radius going out to some point looks a lot like the, the Z going out to some point. Okay. so. So what that means is that it, these spherical waves look like they're coming from uh, from the origin here. So even at the or even though at the origin these waves are pretty flat, once you get far enough out, they're curved. But their curvature uh, points points back to the origin. And so what we'll do is we will put a beam like this in between two spherical mirrors whose surfaces are going to be aligned with these waves. And that will give us a cavity and we'll examine the, the modes inside of that cavity. And that those will become uh, the modes that the atoms in a laser excite. And one of the, one of the mirrors, so say the mirror way on this side, The mirror way on this side is going to be 100% reflective, but the mirror way on this side is going to be 99.9% .9 reflective. 
So there'll be some little bit of light that, that leaks out and actually makes it, makes it out of the laser. So that, that'll be something we'll start to talk about uh, in the next couple of classes, sort of what, what are the modes inside of a laser? How does a laser actually work? Um, where, where do we actually want to put those mirrors? And how do, we, how do we verify experimentally that this is all what's really going on? So uh, something to look forward to for, for next week is sort of getting into the de details of, of laser physics. All right, so um, let me let me take questions. I can stop the recording if people want to ask questions off recording. <laughs>